Hi, everyone. This is Stephanie Rupert. Thank you for joining me. This is episode number one of the Meaning of Everything podcast. Now, normally how this podcast will work is that uh, we're talking about specific issues with guests who are experts in a particular topic and what have you. Uh, but I wanted to, before kicking off all of the interviews and exploring all the content and stuff, to give you a place where you can get an introduction to the podcast, where you can learn a little bit about me. And so if you're not interested in that at all, please feel free to skip. You don't have to listen to this. Uh, but here in the first few episodes, I will uh, be talking about how it works. So first things first, uh, in the first episode, I will talk all about me. I will tell my story. I'll talk about why I'm here. I'll talk about the types of things that I've experienced throughout my life, what I struggle with. Uh, maybe you'll find some things that resonate with you, perhaps not. Uh, and then in the second and third mini episodes, I will be talking about uh, why I think we need uh, this podcast or why it is that I do what I do. And then in the third episode, I'll talk all about how it works and what I am hoping to provide. And so therefore, you can get a sense of whether anything in the podcast is worth listening to uh, simply from the first few episodes. So that's the hope. Bear with me. Don't listen. Do what makes you happy. Everything, uh, all of these episodes are hosted on both YouTube and on all sorts of podcast mediums, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, etc. So uh, listen wherever you think is best. Here you get to uh, look at my face for a little while um, on other mediums. Of course, it's just audio. So choose your poison. All right. So first today in, uh, in the first episode, I'll start with my childhood. I'll start with when I was really young, what I'm doing here. So when I was four years old, four or five, I began having panic attacks about dying and other things besides uh, meaninglessness, purposelessness, why are we here, what's happening, all these sorts of existential questions weighed really heavily on me as a child. Uh, I now know that this is not particularly uncommon uh, for children who are uh, inquisitive and the like, uh, but I, I had no idea back then. And I grew up in a home where we didn't really, we didn't really talk about this kind of thing, uh, and we didn't have a religion to turn to. And so I was always very existentially hungry. I didn't talk to anybody about what I was going through. I didn't. Uh, I once asked my mother what happens when you die? And she said, well, I, I don't know, honey. And I said, well, how do I, you know, who finds out? And she said, uh, you're going to have to find a philosopher. And I was you know, five years old at the time. And here I am uh, 25 and some change years later. And I'm, I'm still, I'm doing the same, the same exact thing. So that was the foundational piece of everything that I have become in my life. These panic attacks uh, were terrible. I would lay in bed and, and tear my hair out and pace around my room like a caged animal with my heart thumping, just feeling this like terror at what it means to be a human being and to not understand, to not be able to make sense of it all. And I have been desperately seeking to make sense of it since. I turned to the sciences in order to do this. I hated religion growing up once I figured out what it was. I remember being on the swings in the playground with other kids and they were making their um, catechisms or what have you. They're um, going through their rites of initiation with the church and I was on the swings and staring off into the distance feeling this like existential despair because I couldn't relate to them. And that's the kind of child I was. So I turned to the sciences. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't immediately apparent that that was where I was meant to be, where I wanted to be. I started going to the public library that was right down the street regularly on the weekends. And I started with philosophy and we had like 16 philosophy books and I picked up Aristotle because I recognized the name and I couldn't, it was the Nicomachean ethics. And I couldn't, I couldn't really make sense of it. You know, I understood maybe 5%. Nowadays I understand maybe 9%. So I've, I've increased it. But uh, when I was young, I, I didn't understand, but I was looking and I, I couldn't connect with what I was finding in philosophy. I hated religion. And then I picked up a book by Carl Sagan, who uh, unfortunately is, is now gone, but he was a brilliant 
scientist and science popularizer. And you talked beautifully about uh, the cosmos and our pale blue dot is what he called it, the earth. And I fell in love with the way that with science, he made the world feel sacred or something. And so then I went to college and I tried, I stayed in the sciences. I studied astrobiology and specifically biogeochemistry, geobiology. Uh, I studied microorganisms and was trying to say something profound about the origins and nature of life, the ubiquity of life in the cosmos. I was seeking a way to like talk about these deep kinds of things that I had wrestled with and sought my entire life. And it was at the end of my time there when I was planning, you know, already making plans to go to graduate school and continue on studying life on Mars and the like. And I was titrating an iron solution in the lab and it just, everything broke. And I realized it wasn't what I wanted to be doing. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible scientist. I'm not good at details. I can't calibrate this iron solution, you know? And so I graduated and I moved to a little village in the Italian Alps because why not? And while I was there, I had the realization that I had rejected religion. I had hated religion my whole life without ever really engaging it. And I had always prided myself on open-mindedness. And I thought, well, you know, maybe it's time to like see, see if they have something to say. And so I printed 500 pages from Zygon, the Journal of Religion and Science. While living in this little village, I went to their printer and um, after reading just a few pages, I thought, well, God, Steph, like these theologians, they have a point. They have something worthwhile to listen to when they're talking about these existentially important questions, who we are, where we're from, what it all means, what our future is going to be like, you know, our, and our experience of it, our hope and our despair, you know, these really deep existential themes, they're talking about it. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's who I need to be in, in conversation with. I then decided to go to seminary. I ended up in Boston and I did uh, a master's degree studying the philosophy of religion, religion and science, uh, theology. I lived in a home full of uh, people aspiring to be uh, pastors. And it was a really important experience. And I fell into this field of religion and science. Now, this field of religion and science is really vast and it encompasses a wide variety of different fields, people in the sciences, people in history, people in philosophy, people in religion, people in theology, everywhere. People who are interested in how our culture developed this kind of dichotomy, this kind of binary, this conflict between religion and science and, and what it means and how we can navigate it and make sense of it. So while I was there, I studied a lot of these things. I learned how to make sense of some of the questions that I had been sitting with my entire life. And it wasn't that I made any kind of religious commitment. I did not. And it wasn't that I even decided that I was going to believe any specific thing because I actually do not. And I will not be able to give you a specific answer. But I did learn a wide variety of different options for ways that I can think about my experience here, what it means, how to think of it metaphysically, how to put the pieces of religion and science and philosophy and what have you together. I learned how to do that in a number of different ways. And that was enough for me. I didn't need to have a concrete answer, but I did have a variety of answers. And I also learned that the despair that I had sat with my entire life was a cultural product. It was something that I inherited from these years of tumultuous religious change and philosophical change. And if I had been born at a different time in a different place, it could have been entirely different. I might not have ever experienced all this sort of pain. And that set me free, which is something I hope that I can do for some of you. So that was really important. And I ended up staying within the field, but being driven less, a little bit less by my own need for answers. I still definitely crave them and I crave playing with questions and, and all of that. But now I also, I try to understand that phenomena of why 
we feel the way that we do in the modern world. You know, how do we make sense of this modern context? How do we become liberated from, from the, the contraptions and the constructions that have kept us down? You know, how do we liberate ourselves? How do we set ourselves free? How do we become the best possible versions of ourselves? These are the kinds of questions that I work with now. So after I finished that degree, I came to Oxford. Uh, I have been here now for more than three years. I'm uh, nearly completed with my doctoral program and I have continued, I study now like what it means to be human, the meaning of things, the meaning of everything. I study uh, what our condition is characterized by, again, who we were in the past, who we are now, who we can be in the future. These are the sorts of things that I deal with and on a regular basis, I'm continuing to deepen my understanding of what it means to be human and working on ways to help connect with other people and deepen all of our understandings because it is really through our knowledge of ourselves and one another that we can heal. You know, it's through learning why we feel the way we do that we can help ourselves feel another way, live another way, behave another way, you know, be inspired and compassionate and all of these things that are deeply important. Uh, and so I will talk about that at more length, the cultural context and the things that I want to provide in, uh, in the next two little mini episodes. But I will end this here for now, talking about myself, uh, talking about how I ended up in this place. Uh, one more quick thing. You may see me pop up. If you happen to Google me, you will see me pop up in a wide variety of contexts. Uh, I also have a career working on women's issues, women's health, and like diet and nutrition, fertility issues. Uh, you will see that uh, I have a not, I have a pretty public presence as a dancer, as a salsa dancer on the internet. I once wrote a blog about uh, salsa dancing. I have published books in the fields of women health. You will find all of these things. Uh, I would hope that that does not take away from my ability to uh, connect with you or think deeply as a philosopher, but rather to uh, enrich, enrich my understanding of, of what it means to be human. I think when your life is consumed by an existential crisis, like mine was from a very young age, one thing that can happen is that you can become like particularly driven to do everything you possibly can. So um, I am forever open to doing more and more things uh, and am open to suggestions and hopefully we'll get to explore a lot of uh, wide ranging but ever relevant deeply thinking and deeping, deeply feeling things here uh, on this podcast video cast uh, and I am very very excited uh, to share with you in that journey so thank you so much for listening to me if you made it to the end uh, ramble about my life, who I am, why I'm here. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure. I will uh, see you next time for episode two.